Good morning. Good morning. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. How are you feeling this morning? Is your spirit all right? You got joy down in your heart? You know God's been good to you? Well, we are blessed if we know all of those things. But believe it or not, there may be somebody sitting beside you who is down in their spirit this morning. We want to remind them that the joy of the Lord is their strength. And that if you're feeling down this morning, just think of his goodness to you. Count your blessings. He woke us up this morning and started us on our way. And so we just want to tell him, Lord, God, no matter what else is going on around us, that when we think about you, you are the one who make us happy down deep in our soul. And we bless you this morning. Join us as we worship. You make me whole You take the pain away I'm so in love with you You make me happy You make me whole You take the pain away I'm so in love with you Sing You make me happy You make me whole you take the pain away, I'm so in love with you. Sing it again, say. You make me happy. And you make me whole. You take the pain away. I'm so in love. Cause everything. And you make me whole. You take the pain away. I'm so in love. Cause everything about you is right. It covers all my wrongs. Your life saves my life. Yeah, cause everything about
with you is where I belong. Lord, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, God, there are mercies forevermore. Surely, the presence of the Lord is in this place. And if you're in need of something, if you're in need of a blessing, if you're in need of a miracle, I'm in need of a blessing this morning. I don't know about you. But I know, I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, I can find it right here. In the presence of the Lord. Because he's in this place. Worship with us.
God, we thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for moving in this building, God. Thank you for walking up and down the aisles and knowing what each and every one of us stand in need of. God, thank you for sitting beside us in our chair or in our pew. Thank you, thank you, God, for your presence in this place. Amen.
clap your hands, stand on your feet. Let's worship the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. We have come today to praise and magnify.
morning because my mom had a procedure on Thursday. But I'm glad I had to come to church and give God some praise. God ain't having the praises of his people. When praises go up, blessings come down. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. I got a right to praise. in here this morning. Thank you.
the Lord. Let the church say amen. Amen. We just have to thank him, don't we? We have to thank him because of his goodness to us and the love that he lavished upon us. We have to thank him. My brothers and sisters, I would like for you to turn in your Bibles to uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, uh, beginning with verse 9. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 9. From the word of God. Picking up in the middle of a conversation that Jesus was having with one of his disciples. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. May the Lord bless the hearing and the reading of his holy word. Amen. Very truly, Jesus said, I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Wow. Because I am going uh, to the Father. Let's go to God in prayer. Turn to God, our Father. We're thankful, Lord, for this day. We're thankful, Lord, for this time of sharing. Uh, we're thankful for the testimony that was given about us becoming serious about our personal devotional time and our corporate study time, Lord. And I ask now that you would speak to the hearts of your people. May make known to us your will in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The subject of our sharing this morning is whoever believes will do the works of Jesus. Now, that's something serious right there. Whoever believes will do the works of Jesus. The verses of our text this morning, as many of you know, are the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before he was crucified. Now, of course, they are part of a much larger discourse that begins in John chapter 13 and ends at John chapter 17. But the main thing is that Jesus explains to his disciples what's going to happen to them after he's gone. Now, he says many things, but one of the things that stands out during the course of this discourse is that he said to his disciples, he says, he says, I'm not going to leave you alone, even though I'm going away. I'm not going to leave you alone, but I'm going to come back to be with you in a different way. And I'm going to live in you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he went on to say the Holy Spirit is going to be your comforter and the Holy Spirit is going to lead and guide you into all truth so that you will never be alone. Jesus was saying to them, even though I'm going away to the right hand of the Father, I will always be with you. You will never be alone. And I thought about that because, you know, loneliness is a real issue for many people uh, in the world and in our churches. It's a real issue. But the fact of the matter is that if you are a child of God, at the very core of your being lives the Holy Spirit. And even though you may not have human companionship, which many of us want, even though you may not have human companionship, you do have the Spirit of God, and you ought to make it one of your goals in life to get to know Him. You know, I remember uh, one time after I had been called into the ministry, called to serve the Lord, I remember how alone I felt because things had radically changed for me socially. But as I was praying on that same night, 
Let me tell you something. The Spirit of God filled me. And he filled me up and up and up until all of the loneliness went away. And I want to tell you something. That can be your experience with the Lord as well. And the Lord can touch you in a way that will let you know that he will always be with you. And he can do that not just once, not just twice, but he can do that many times throughout your life. Uh, having an experience with the Lord doesn't have to be a one-time thing. Because as you grow in your relationship and not in religion, it is really something, quite frankly, that can happen on a daily basis. So I'm here to tell you that if you make it your goal to get to know the Lord, you will have many conversations, you will have many interactions with the Lord, and, the, and you will have them through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's why I believe, at least, that I have such a, a hunger for us to go deeper and further than we have as a church and as a people because I know that we have yet to experience much more of the fullness and the presence and the power and the victory of our God, of our wonderful and exciting God. I feel that we have far more to experience than we have yet experienced of our God. Now, now before we get to the words of our text, I want to share with you uh, what Jesus said at the beginning of John chapter 14 uh, because I believe last night he spoke so powerfully to me about that and I also believe that it will provide us with some context uh, when we get to the verses of our text. I feel that at the beginning of John chapter 14, you know what Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. I believe that at the very beginning of that chapter, Jesus is saying to his disciples and he's saying to us who by by extension, are the disciples of today, he's saying to us, stay focused. Stay focused. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be shaken. Don't let your hearts be filled with fear. Don't let your hearts be so easily swayed. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. I believe Jesus is saying, listen to me. In life, things are going to happen to try and distract you from following God. The enemy is going to do any and everything he possibly can to get you off track. People will betray you, just like Judas betrayed Jesus. Huh? In the heat of the moment, people will deny knowing you, right? Like Peter denied knowing Jesus. Huh? Out of fear or whatever people might be going through, they might abandon you when you need them the most. Like the disciples abandoned Jesus when the soldiers came to arrest him. You know, people will talk about you, even when they don't really know the truth, but they'll talk about you based upon what somebody else said, and they don't know if they're lying or not. They don't know if they twisted the truth or not, but nevertheless, they will open their mouths to talk about you. Your body may be assaulted. Your finances may be attacked. Your relationships may experience chaos, but all of these now, are just distractions to pull you away from God. And I believe that Jesus is saying to us at the beginning of John chapter 14, he's saying, stay focused and remember in whom you have believed. You have put your trust in someone who died for you. You have put your trust in someone who now lives for you. You have put your trust in someone who has gone to prepare a place for you in the kingdom of God. And he says he's coming back for you. So stay focused and remember who you belong to and to whom you owe your allegiance. Stay focused. That's what Jesus is saying. So Jesus said to them last night, he said, listen, I'm going away, but you know where I'm going. And, and Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how, how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know I'm going to the Father, so no one comes to the Father except through me. Philip said to him at that point, Philip said, well, Lord, why don't you show us the Father? And then that will be enough for us. That will be sufficient. We want to see him with our own eyes. We want a little more proof that you're actually going to the Father. And that's what leads us into our text this morning. So Jesus then said to Philip, he says, Philip, how long have I been with you? Huh? 
I've been with you now for about three and a half years, and yet you still don't know who I am? He said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say to me, Philip, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? You see, see, Philip was very practical. He didn't like all this abstraction. Do you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? He said, even the words right now that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but it is Father living on the inside of me who is speaking. It is the Father who is doing the work. And, and right here, I believe in, in, in that statement, in those statements, Jesus models for us what our relationship with him ought to be like. Listen, Jesus, Jesus' relationship with the Father was so intimate, it was so close that he could say the Father and I are one. He could say things like, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. That's how closely connected we are to one another. But at the same time, my brothers and sisters, that's how closely connected we should be to our Lord and Savior through the Spirit. Uh, we ought to be able to get to the place where we are able to say the words that I speak, I don't speak on my own authority, but it is Christ who speaks in me, and it is Christ who is doing the work through me, right? Now, you know, this doesn't mean, for those of you who may be kind of skeptical. This doesn't mean that you can't say good morning to somebody uh, without Jesus telling you to. I ain't, I ain't talking about that. Uh, We're on a different level, right? I'm saying, however, that we should become so sensitive to our Lord's voice and presence that we become a vessel through whom he can speak and through whom he can act. In other words, the more conscious and the more sensitive you become to the Holy Spirit, who is living on the inside of you, the more carefully you will speak, uh, the more careful uh, you will be with your words. Uh, you will be careful not just to let anything come out of your mouth, right? You know, some of us have the same problem as the president. We just say any carnal thing that comes to our mind or that dwells in our hearts. You know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So everything is not spontaneous. Sometimes we thought about this thing, and we say, I'm just going to give them a piece of my mind when we should have kept our mouths shut. Praise God. Because we know that what we said did not honor our Lord. But the point, the point I'm trying to make, though, is that you can become a vessel through, you can become a vessel now, through whom Christ speaks, and you don't have to be a preacher to do it. You see what I'm saying? You don't have to get up here to do that. I'm saying every single day of your lives, all right, you can walk and live among people, and you can manifest to them the will of God and the words of God if you are intent on being connected to him. Then Jesus says something in our text of Philip. He says something to his disciples that is absolutely stunning when you think about it. He said to Philip, he said, if you don't believe the Father is in me or I am in the Father, he said, at least believe on the evidence of the works that I have done. And what were the works of Jesus? Well, he healed people of their sickness and disease. He made the blind to see. He made the lame to walk. He raised people from the dead. He delivered them from evil spirits. He forgave people of their sins. He once fed well over 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. Uh, at one time, he fed over 4,000 people with three fish and I believe seven loaves of bread. Those were the works that Jesus was taught. He said, if you don't believe that the Father's in me and I'm in the Father, at least believe me because of the works that I have done. And what did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to destroy Jesus came to destroy any and everything that keeps us from being in a healthy relationship with God. He healed people of their sicknesses and disease. Why? Because God never intended that for us. That's in the Bible, huh? 
all of that is a byproduct of sin in the world. Sickness and disease come from Satan, hear me now, not from God. The Bible says the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus came that we might have what? That we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. But many times, you know, even as I'm preaching now, many times, you know what we do? We gloss over the obvious record of what Jesus did. We read it. And we keep on living because there are some things about what Jesus did we just can't understand. It's too far away from us in the minds of many. And so we make these things metaphorical. You know, on New Year's Eve at the anointing service, I preached about something that is uh, critical to our transformation. And that is putting off the old nature and putting on the new nature. Paul said in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, he says, he says, we're going to make, be made new. We're going to be fully able to embrace the new nature that Christ has given us, and we'll be able to do that in the attitude of our minds, right? Romans 12 chapter says that we ought to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Isn't that something? In other words, God has already given us a new spirit. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means to be born again. But, but now we need to change the way we think. That's how we become more mature. That's how we participate with God in our own spiritual growth. We change the way we think. We change the way we see ourselves. And we change the way we see our situation. And we change the way we see the world in accordance to what the Word of God says and not just the best advice in some magazine. That's right. Uh, uh, Paul says... That if you're going to be transformed and if you're going to live the kind of life that the Lord wants you to live, you've got to be transformed by the renewing of your minds. In other words, it's all about having a kingdom mindset. It's all about believing what the word of God says. And so Jesus says something in our text that we can gloss over if we want to, but nevertheless, it's the word of God. This is how the Lord wants us to think, and this is how the Lord wants us to be in this world. In our text, in verse 12, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. Now, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. Whoever believes in me, they will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, he said, because I am going to the Father. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. Now, let's stop. Let's just stop right there. We, we, really, we really can't go any further, can we? Is Jesus saying in this text that it is possible to do at least some of the things that he did. Is he saying that? Was Jesus saying that while he was away with the Father, he wanted his disciples, he wanted us, to speak and act on his behalf and to do what he did while he was here? Is that what Jesus is saying? I believe that's what whoever, he said, believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. Is that what Jesus is saying? Are y'all, hello, is that what I'm talking to myself? Is, is podium, podium, is that what Jesus is saying? Whoever believes in me, the works that I do, he will do as well. I believe that's exactly what he's saying. And apparently the disciples knew this because during his ministry and after his ministry, they did the works of Jesus. But now what about us? What, what about us? What about us? Are we just another organization like some of the fraternities and the sororities around, huh? Are we just some kind of philanthropic organization? I just, I'm just asking the question. You know, there's a story, there's a story in the Gospels about Jesus healing a demon-possessed boy. The Bible tells us that while Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, his disciples, his disciples while he was away, they, they tried to heal this boy, and they tried to 
cast out the evil spirit that was in this boy, but they could not. So when Jesus came back from the mountain, he saw a commotion going on because his disciples were arguing, I think, with the Pharisees or some of the religious leaders of their day. And when Jesus asked what was going on, the Bible tells us that the father of the boy stepped forward and he explained to him the situation. And he said, I tried to get your disciples to cast this spirit out, but they could not. And then Jesus, in, in, the, in the text, particularly in Mark and in Matthew, it says that Jesus looked at his disciples and he says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, you have so little faith. How long must I be with you? How long must I abide with you? How long am I going to have to stay with you and try to teach you all the things that I've shown you to do? Now, now, now that just boggles my mind that Jesus was actually frustrated with his disciples that they couldn't do something on this level huh? because I'm sure that many of us I'm sure that many of us have not been that deep uh, when it comes to delivering someone uh, who is bound uh, by a spirit or by whatever. He, he, Jesus said, you, you, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Then the father said to Jesus, he said, he says, Lord, if you can, help us. Then Jesus said, if you can, he said, nothing is impossible for him who believes. And then the man said, well, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Bible says that Jesus cast the spirit out of the boy, and the boy was healed. Later on in the Gospel of Matthew, his disciples, when they were in private, they asked him, said, Lord, why couldn't we cast it out? And Jesus said, because of your little faith. Because of your little faith. I believe, I believe now that if we don't change our mindset, then like the father of that boy and like the, the disciples at that particular time, now they moved on from that point because they grew, but like the disciples at that time, many people will continue to suffer because we are not functioning as mature sons and daughters of God who represent a kingdom that has come to destroy the works of the devil in our lives and in the lives of others. I'm here to tell you, I think that many, many more people in our families and around us will suffer because of our little faith, because of our unwillingness to step out beyond. And when you step out beyond, sometimes you make mistakes. Sometimes you fail like the disciples fail, but they did try to cast that spirit out of the boy. At least they knew to try to cast them out, huh? I believe that if we continue as we are, many people will continue to suffer even though now you and I represent a kingdom that has come to destroy the works of the devil. Isn't that something? My, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus says, Jesus says this. He says, you are a new creation. Isn't that what he says? He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's right. His seed, the seed of Christ, this new nature, is on the inside of us. And we are designed to overcome and destroy the enemy's works. And we are designed to crush the enemy under our feet. But, but your mindset... Our mindset has got to change if we're going to truly try to be a part of the Lord's ministry, right? These are the things that Jesus told his disciples on the last night that he was with them, right? He showed it to them. He demonstrated what it meant to actually disrupt the enemy's kingdom. He showed them what it meant to deliver people who were bound by whatever it might be. He showed them that it was God's will, that it was not, that it was not God's will for any of his people to suffer not only spiritually but physically. Man, I just, I'm here to tell you that if we're going to do the works of Jesus, we got to have a different mindset, all right? On that last night that he was with them, you know, he didn't tell them earthly things. I, nothing that I read to you was about an earthly matter. 
He didn't tell them about fleshly or carnal things, but he told them about God's vision. And he told them about God's purpose for their lives. All of this requires a different mindset. When you read the Gospels, have you ever, have you ever just read the Gospels and just gotten stumped at a part and just said, you know, I, I just don't understand this. This does not mirror my experience. This does not line up with reality as I know it. As a matter of fact, the fact that Jesus was dead for three days in the ground and was raised from the dead by the power of God does not, in a very real sense, mirror our experience. So that means that the Holy Spirit has to give you the faith to believe that. All right? Now, now if he gives you the faith to believe that, that also means that he wants to give you the power to do the things that Christ did. If you have, listen, man, if you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, if you believe that Jesus healed people of leprosy, if you believe that Jesus and his disciples laid hands on those who were paralyzed and they got up and started walking, if you believe all of that, you mean to tell me, huh? You mean to tell me that you don't think it's for you to walk in that type of power, to walk in that type of victory? The devil is a lie. It is for you to walk in that type of victory. He reminded them on that last night. He reminded them, he says, that you won't be able to make it if you do not abide in me. He said, if you abide in me, all things are possible. Uh -huh. If you abide in me, I will do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you ask or think. If you do not abide in me, you will struggle intensely. I know about that struggle. Huh? I know what it means to be a Christian and not live up to who I say that I am. That, that's, that comes from not abiding in whatever way, not abiding in the Lord. So, you know, I thought about this because it's Martin. You know, on the last night of living. Dr. King had gained a different mindset as well. He did. He said in that last speech, he said, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. He said, but I'm not concerned about that. Now his mindset had changed. He said, I just want to do God's will. He said, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. He said, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. He said, so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I'm here to tell you that we will get to the promised land if we change our mindset and become more concerned about doing the will of God rather than what people might think about us. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, he will do the works. My God, Lord, help me to grasp it. He will do the works that I have been doing. You will be able to do the works. We will be able to do the works of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that the gates of hell will tremble. That's right, when we come in his name. Amen? Amen. The doors of the church are open. Yeah. Yeah, in his name. Yeah. You know, the doors of the church are open, and we invite you to become a part of us. We're not a perfect church. We're, we're striving to be all that God would have us to be. If you don't know the Lord, never accepted him into your life of your own volition, of your own will, we invite you to do that now. We have ministers who can help facilitate that process. If you don't have a church home, you need one. You know, let's, let's not get caught up in the way we do church in the world today. Everyone needs a church home. And we're seeking to become better about being a community of faith who interact with one another, who have fellowship with one another, who love one another, and who work together and pray together and seek God's will together. We invite you to become a part of us.